Now we're in the 14.2, where the second um, group of lectures dealing with Chapter 14 of, on the Federal Reserve System. But now we're going to focus on discount loans and open market operations. We mentioned discount loans before, but let's go now and explain a little, little more detail what they are. Now, the Federal Reserve um, can make loans, but they can only make them to banks. And they make them to banks when banks need to borrow reserves. Let's go back and think about the reserve issue. Go, let's go use our <clears throat> bullet points here to, to keep this in track. So private banks earn income by making loans. That should be pretty obvious. That's the business that banks are in. So they try to lend, fully lend out their excess reserves. Doesn't that make sense to you? If the, if the Federal um, Reserve requires that you keep 20% of your total deposits sitting in cash, what would you do with the rest of your deposits? Well, of course, you'd go be looking for loans. You'd make car loans, house loans, business loans, credit card loans, all the different kinds of loans that banks make that earn income. So banks really don't want to keep excess reserves if they can help it, because excess reserves are by definition cash in the vault or a free deposit sitting at the Federal Reserve System, and those don't earn any money. So banks want to lend out their excess reserves. Now, at times, a bank may fall short of satisfying the reserve requirement. What does that mean? Well, if banks are aggressive and they're searching for loan customers, it may turn out to be that in a particular week, they've actually made more loans and therefore got rid of excess reserves to the point that not only did they lend out the excess reserves, but they kind of stepped over the line and lent out some of those reserves that were required to be there. Now, the Federal Reserve doesn't have you arrested for doing something like that, as long as, of course, you plan on getting back in line at some point. What you must do every single week, every bank has to file a report on this issue, if they are falling behind in their reserves, meaning they've lent too much money out compared to the amount that they're permitted to lend out, they can borrow the reserves and then put the reserves in the vault or put the reserves in the Federal Reserve. Now, I usually use the vault because it's a nice, easy thing for us to put in our heads as to what the bank is physically doing. So whether they're putting it on reserve at the Federal Reserve or putting it in reserve in their own vaults, it's essentially the same thing. It's sterile cash that earns no interest. So banks don't really like to do this. They only do it because it's legally required of them to do it. So if one bank has a lot of deposits but doesn't have very many loan opportunities, picture a small bank in South Georgia with lots of farmers depositing lots of money in the bank. And so there's tons of money sitting in the bank, but there's not very many businesses in town. So there's not really much use for lending. And so the bank has all these excess reserves that they haven't lent out. Another bank, say in Atlanta, has tons of businesses to lend money to, far more businesses than there are depositors to put money in the bank. So the bank has lent out too many of their reserves. And so the Citibank in Atlanta could go borrow the reserves that are excess held by the South Georgia Bank. Now, of course, that's just an example. It could actually be city to city bank. You know, whatever banks happen to be, some of them are aggressive lenders and have lent out all of their reserves and other banks still have excess reserves laying around. Now, the market in which these loans take place is called the federal funds market and the interest rate that the bank that has the excess reserves that's lending the excess reserves to the bank that's short of reserves is called the federal funds rate. So that should make perfect sense. Federal funds are the money that are that's being borrowed back and forth, borrow or lent, and it's money that is excess reserves, and it's being charged the federal funds rate. Now, that rate is determined by supply and demand in a market, not by the government. That's not the government's rate. That is a competitive market rate. Now, the Federal Reserve can also make loans of their own, because so far through the federal funds market, we're talking about one bank lending to another bank. So it's kind of like a peer-to-peer, bank-to-bank loan. Now, Sometimes a bank, instead of reaching out to another bank to borrow reserves, can, re can go to the Fed and borrow money directly from the Federal Reserve to put in the vault. And that would be called a discount loan. So the Federal Reserve directly makes discount loans to banks. Banks can make loans to each other through the federal funds market. So just so you recognize there are two distinct markets here. But of course, they're trying to accomplish the same thing. One bank ran short of reserves because it lent out too much money and needs to put reserves in the vault in order to have its legal requirements set by the end of the week.
Now, let's think about what happens if the discount rate is raised. In other words, the Federal Reserve is lending excess reserves for banks that um, need the excess reserves. It's charging them an interest rate. What if the Federal Reserve raises that interest rate? What do you think um, starts to happen? Are banks really interested in borrowing from the Federal Reserve? Well, of course not. No one wants to pay extra for anything. So banks would cut back on the amount that they borrow. So the fewer reserves that are borrowed, that means fewer loans are made, and that would decrease the money supply. So here's the chain of events. The Federal Reserve raises their discount rate. Banks are discouraged from borrowing the excess reserves. Therefore, the banks don't have excess reserves to lend out, and therefore the money supply is lower than it would otherwise be. Vice versa, in the next column of, of data on our slide, we see what if the discount rate was lowered? So the Federal Reserve says we normally charge 5%, let's charge 2%. So obviously banks would look at that as, wow, money is cheap at the Federal Reserve. Let's go borrow it. When we bring it back to our bank, we will have excess reserves and then we can lend that money out and we can probably charge way more than 2% for it. So we'll make money on the deal. So obviously if the Federal Reserve lowers their discount rate, banks have an incentive to borrow from the Federal Reserve and then turn around and make loans to other people. And then through the process we've covered in previous lectures, there will be an increase in the money supply. So the Federal Reserve could do this deliberately in either direction, either decrease the money supply by raising the discount rate or increase the money supply by lowering the discount rate. Now let's go back to the federal funds market for a minute. Remember we mentioned that that's borrowing reserves by one bank from another, or is called the federal funds market. And the federal funds rate is the interest rate paid to borrow in that market. That Federal funds rate is determined by supply and demand. If there are, if there were an economic boom and there's tons of lending opportunities, then lots of banks want to lend out and very few of them have excess reserves. So there's a shortage of excess reserves, lots of demand. You all know supply and demand from previous chapters that will push up the price. So you would expect the federal funds rate to rise in the market. Vice versa, let's say we're in a recession. So there's very few lending opportunities because very few businesses are good credit during a, you know, a, bad, a bad economic downturn. So there are very few banks willing to lend the money out. So that means they got tons of money sitting around in the, in the vaults. So if they try to lend it to each other, they obviously have to accept a lower interest rate because there's an excess amount of reserves laying around. So we can recognize that the federal funds rate often tells the Federal Reserve how tight money supply is or how loose money supply is out in the market. Now, there's a couple of other methods that banks have available to them besides um, borrowing from the Federal Reserve. Banks who, who need more reserves can also sell some of their securities. Now, what do we mean by selling their securities? Well, banks not only make loans, banks also invest in securities. In particular, they invest in bonds. We'll talk about bonds in a lot more detail in, in just a moment, but a government bond is a very, very secure debt obligation where the government goes out to the open market on Wall Street and says, we'd like to borrow a million dollars. We'll give you this certificate. You give us the million dollars and we promise to pay you 8% every year. That would be an example. Okay. So that would be an example of a government bond. Now banks, instead of making loans, let's say a car loan um, earning five or 6%, and you've got a government bond paying roughly the same, the government bond is way safer. So many banks, instead of making loans, oftentimes prefer to have a portfolio of these government bonds or securities. They turn out to be very liquid as well because there's a huge market for them. So you can buy, buy them on one day and then turn around the next day and sell them if you need cash. Whereas if you had made a car loan, it's pretty hard to ask the person to pay off their car loan. You know, they took out a five-year car loan. They're not going to give you the money back except monthly payments for the next five years. But what if you needed all the money today? If you had a security, you could sell it. So banks, in order to maintain liquidity, oftentimes have a large portfolio of securities. So for this particular slide, what your author is trying to get you to recognize is if a bank was running short of reserves because it made too many loans, but it had several million dollars worth of securities on hand, it could simply sell the securities, get the cash, and then put the cash in the vault, and all of a sudden they're perfectly legal again because they now have all the reserves that they need. So 
the Federal Reserve can now influence banks' decisions on whether they're going to make loans or not by manipulating interest rates in the bond market. Let's take a look at how we do that. The mechanism is called the open market operations. This is the principal mechanism to, uh, the, used by the Federal Reserve to directly alter the reserves of the banking system. Let's go through, first of all, we'll just read the bullet statements together, then I'll try to give you a good example that illustrates how this works. So, first bullet statement says, when the, Fed, the Federal Reserve, Fed, buys government bonds from the public, reserves increase, more loans can be made, and the money supply grows. Why does that work? Let's remember, if the Federal Reserve buys a government bond from the public, what does that mean? Well, the Federal Reserve pays for it. But where does the Federal Reserve get the money? Ah, they get to print it. They're the only organization in society that can simply print money. So when the Federal Reserve goes out to Wall Street and says, we'd like to buy a government bond, and some investor owns the government bond, they sell it to the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve pays for it with cash that they've just printed, that person, of course, doesn't walk around with a million dollars in their pocket. They deposit it in a bank somewhere. And then what happens to the amount of um, reserves the bank has? It rises dramatically. Then the bank can now start to lend money again. And then, of course, the money supply grows. Vice versa. What if the Federal Reserve sells a government bond to the public? Well, then obviously an investor who bought the bond, let's again say it's a million dollars worth of bonds, the person has to pay for those bonds, so they write a check to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve cashes the check and then pulls the money out of the bank. So what happens to the total amount of reserves in the banking system? Reserves decrease. If reserves decrease, obviously you can't make a bank cannot make as many loans as they normally can make, and therefore the total amount of lending goes down, and then of course the money supply shrinks. So if the Federal Reserve wants to increase the money supply, they buy the government bonds from the public. When they want to decrease the money supply, they sell government bonds to the, um, to the public. And then, of course, the rest, of, as I gave that little um, chain of link of examples, then the rest of the, the, you know, the, the issue um, moves forward. And here's a diagram of it. Uh, the diagram, uh, let's see if we can make sense of this. On the far left, we have the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve is going to, um, in this particular example, is going to sell a bond. Now, what's moving in the arrow in this direction is cash, okay? So the Fed, they're not showing the arrow where the bond is going. The bond would be going in this direction. It's cash that's being diagrammed in this direction. Well, the cash comes from the public. Where does the public get the money from? Well, of course, from their bank balance. So as the cash flows from the bank, and then the public uses the money to, to, to um, buy the bond from the Fed, then what happens to the reserves at the bank? The reserve goes down. Vice versa, what if the Federal Reserve buys a bond? Then cash flows from the Federal Reserve to the public, then the public takes the cash, puts it in the bank, and then what happens to reserves in the bank? The reserves rise. So now we can see the chain of events, causal chain of events, from when the Federal Reserve makes a decision to either buy a bond or sell a bond. Now, I recommend you don't try to memorize it. Just work through an example of your own, just like I did, and even put a name on the, on the investor. This is Mr. Smith. The Federal Reserve sells a million dollar bond to Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith has to pay for it. Where is Mr. Smith going to get the money? He pulls it out of his bank. What does that just do to reserves in the banks? It reduces the reserves. Banks now, now can no longer make as many loans. So that, would, that was the whole purpose the Federal Reserve had in mind, was trying to get banks to cut back on their lending, to try to cut back on the total money supply in the system. Now, later on in, from, in future chapters, we'll get into way more detail as to why the Federal Reserve wants to do this. But at this point, we're going through the mechanics of how the Federal Reserve does do it. Now, let's take a look at what impact this um, uh, buying and selling of bonds has on the bond market and on something called yield. Now, the bond itself, or a security, but we'll, we'll focus on a particular security called a bond, is a certificate acknowledging a debt and the amount of interest to be paid on it every year until re um, repayment. It's also known as an IOU. So a bond is just an evidence of a debt. So people can buy and sell these bonds. This would be no different than if you, I presume most of you all have bought a car and signed a card note. What if you could take the car note and go to Wall Street and say, hey, anyone want to buy this car note from me? 
well, then you could sell it to somebody, right? Because they could get to collect all the monthly payments. So the certificates themselves are debts and the debts are valuable and can be bought and sold on the open market. Now, the interest rate the bond will earn is referred to as the bond yield. And here's the formula for it here in our box. The bond yield is equal to the dollars of annual interest payment divided by the price paid for the bond. On the next slide, we're gonna go ahead and actually run through some numbers to illustrate this. Let's assume you paid $1,000 for a bond and that bond pays $80 a year in interest. What's the yield? Well, according to that formula, and I've got it all written out right here, you see it right here? It's the $80 of interest divided by the $1,000 you paid is 0 0.08, which we normally call 8%. I presume everyone's comfortable with moving the decimal place over two spices to the right, and that's how you turn a decimal number into a percent number. So if the bond was paying $80 of interest and you paid $1,000 to own it, you would receive 8% per year interest. Now, of course, that's a pretty good deal. This is why investors want to buy these bonds because of the, inter the $80 interest every year that they're earning. But let's take a look at what would happen. What would happen in the market if the price for those bonds fell to $900 for some reason? What would the yield be to the new owner who bought it from you at $900? Well, the way bonds are designed, just like with your car payment, the car payment remains the same every single month. The same thing is true for the bond payments. The bond interest payment is, um, they only pay them semi-annually, so every six months you get an interest rate check. Now, for the whole year, in this case, it's $80. That's by assumption. Now, of course, every single bond will be different depending on when the bond was issued and what interest rate it had on it, but in this example, it's $80. But if somebody paid you $900 from you to buy it, think about what this means. Let's look at our formula. Remember the yield says dollar of interest divided by price paid. In this case, it's $80 divided by $900. So now what does that bond earn for somebody? It yields now 8.9%. And does that make sense to everybody? If you paid less than a thousand, but you're still receiving the full $80 of interest, then your rate of return or your yield will be higher than the person who had to pay the full thousand dollars for it. And then vice versa, let's go to the next bullet point. What if you had to pay $1,100 for this bond paying $80 worth of interest per year? Then what would happen to your yield? Well, again, you plug it in the exact same formula, dollar of interest divided by price paid, so 80 divided by 1,100, it now yields 0.073 or 7.3% per year. So the yield on a bond can change based on the market price of the bond. The dollars of interest never changes for the entire length of the bond, but the value of the bond changes depending on market conditions. And so now we start to recognize that if the Federal Reserve can manipulate what interest rate they're willing to pay or what price they're willing to pay for the bonds, they can change the yield, okay? not by changing the actual $80 per month, but by changing the value of the bond, the rate of return or yield earned by the person who buys it will now change. So our last two bullet points, lower prices equal higher yields and higher prices equal lower yields. That sounds counterintuitive, but remember, when you pay the higher price, you're not getting more interest. You're getting the same interest, it's $80 but now you're paying 1,100 to only get 80. So what's happening to the yield you're earning? It's going down because obviously $80 as a percentage of, of paying 1,100 is a smaller yield than, than earning $80 and only paying $1,000 for it. So the lower the price the bond is, the higher its yield, and the higher the price of the bond, the lower its yield. And of course, in a future lecture, we'll be using that information.